Hi everyone, today we're talking about trees. So probably most of you have a little bit of experience from CS61A in trees, and we will take it from there. The most general definition of a tree doesn't even necessarily have a root that you might be familiar with. So a tree is a set of nodes and edges. Then the edges connect the nodes together. And what makes a tree special is that between any two nodes, there is exactly one path and only one path. What is a path? A path is a connected sequence of edges. So here's an example of a tree. So the circles are the nodes, and you can see that in this tree, from any one node to any one to any other node, there's exactly one path that gets you there. Now, if you guys have seen trees before, probably you haven't seen this sort of general kind of tree, but rather you've seen rooted trees, and you can convert a general tree like this into a rooted tree just by choosing any one node, it doesn't, may not even matter which one, but some special designated node and just call that node the root. And then of course, usually, customarily, we redraw the tree so that the root is at the top. And then we have a rooted tree. Now, once you've chosen the root, a bunch of magic happens. Suddenly, every node except the root acquires a parent. So if we take any node C that is not the root, it has one parent node called P. And P is the first node that you encounter on the path from C to the root. And since there's only one path from C to the root, that's always unambiguous who's the parent. And if P is the parent of C, then C is called a child of uh, P. Now, the root is special. The root is the one node in the tree that has no parent. And in these general kinds of trees, one node is allowed to have any number of children. So, for example, in this tree here, if I pick out this node and label it C, then the parent of C is this node, because this is the first node on the path to the root. And then C is a child of P. And P also has this other child, which I'll call D. 
and P could have any number of children. There's no limit. Now, I have to give you a whole, oh, question. Uh, for a tree to be a tree at all, you have to not have any circular paths. So as soon as you have a circle, now you have two different paths between any pair of nodes. Like if I do this, there's two paths from this node to this node. You could go this way, or you could go this way, and that's illegal in a tree. So a tree doesn't have any cycles or loops at all. Other questions? Okay, I need to give you a big long list of definitions now, because trees just have a language of their own that we have to learn before we can talk about them intelligently. So let's get through this. A leaf, or a leaf node, is a node with no children. Like C over there on the other board, C is a leaf node. Siblings are nodes that have the same parent. A node has ancestors. The ancestors of a node D <clears throat> well, the ancestors of a node D are D's parent, D's parent's parent, D's great grandparent, and so far so on all the way up to the root. But this might seem strange, but for formal reasons, D is also considered to be an ancestor of itself. So, uh, the ancestors of D are the nodes on the path from D to the root and I mean all the nodes on the path from D to the root, including D itself D's parent, D's grandparent, D's great-grandparent, and so on. And always including the roots. And if some node A is an ancestor of D, then D is said to be a descendant of A. The length of a path the length of a path is the number of edges in the path. Now you notice it's not the number of vertices in a path, it's the number of edges in the path, which is one less than the number of vertices. And so for instance, we can talk about an empty path, like there is a path that goes from C to itself that has length zero. That's just the null path. There's a path from C to P that has length one, because it's one edge in that path. And the path from C to the root has length three. Once we've established the lengths of paths, we can talk about the depths and the heights of nodes in the tree. So the depth of a node, let's call the node n, is the length of the path from n to the root. And to give an example, the depth of the root is zero. In every tree. And in that particular tree up there, the depth of C is three.
the height of a node Again, let's call it n, the node, uh, is the length of the path from n to its deepest descendant. Again, to give an example, the height of any leaf node is zero. Now that we've defined the height of a node, we can define the height of an entire tree, which is the height of the root. Now, trees have subtrees, like we can cut off a tree at a certain point and get a branch of it, and, you know, that's a tree itself. So the subtree rooted at a node n in a tree is basically the tree formed by n and all of its descendants. So basically, if you take n and you snip it off from its parent, then the piece that you've cut off with n in it, that's a subtree. Although you don't actually have to cut it off to call it a subtree. There's also a special kind of subtree, or a, sorry, a special kind of tree that we'll work with a lot this semester called a binary tree. Binary trees are special in two ways. First of all, no node has more than two children, which is where the word binary comes from. And there's one other fact about binary trees we're going to exploit, one extra property, which is that in a binary tree, every child is either a left child or a right child of its parent, even if it's the only child. You may be the only child, but you still have to pick. You're left or you're right. You can't be in the middle. Questions about any of these definitions? All right. So, trees. Oh, a question over here. Yeah. I am. A node cannot have two left children or two right children. If it has two children, one has to be left and one has to be right. Yeah. Now, of course, the traditional way of drawing rooted trees, probably most of you have seen, is not like this, but with the root at the top. And a, a rooted tree is a natural way of drawing the structure of a file system and its directories. So like if we look at the web pages for this class, there's sort of a root level directory called tilde JRS slash 61B. And then this has a bunch of children corresponding to different either subdirectories like homework or files like index.html, which is the main web page you see when you first go there, or the lab subdirectory, or the lecture subdirectory. And homework has subdirectories named homework1 and homework2. 
lab has subdirectories named lab1 and lab2. And lecture has all the lecture note files and little separate files, and so on and so forth. So this one up here, that's the root node. And sort of everything here, as I've drawn the tree, these are leaf nodes. Now, forget about the fact that in the real directory, there are files in these subdirectories. For the tree, as I have drawn it on the board, those are the leaf nodes. All right. So what I want is a data structure for representing these. And there's several ways you could go here. So for instance, there's what Goodrich and Thomasia do is kind of the most obvious way. So in the formulation, Goodrich and Thomasia, each node of the tree has three references. Uh, one that points to the item that's stored in the node, one that points to the parent, so you can always find the parent quickly, and one that points to the children. Now, the thing about a rooted tree is that a node can have any number of children, so you can't have a separate reference here for each one of them. You have to build them into a list somehow. So whatever your favorite list data structure is, you can use that. And that way it can have as many children as you like. But well, this is the simplest data structure, but I want to talk about a different one that's a little less obvious and that therefore maybe a little more interesting. It doesn't necessarily make it better, but the advantage is the one that I'm going to show you is that it uses less memory because the list data structure is kind of built into the nodes of the tree. The disadvantage of the one that I'm going to show you is that it, <clears throat> it doesn't reuse the list code you've already written. So in effect, you wind up writing list code all over again. So advantages, disadvantages, you can decide which one you'd rather use in real life if you ever need to do this. But here's the alternative option. It's similar to this option in the sense that you've got your item and you've got your parent, but instead of storing the children in a list, I'm going to have the siblings be directly linked to each other. And so I'm going to design my classes so that there's a direct link from each node to its next sibling of the same parent. So here's the class definitions for that. I'm not worrying about the project, project, protections right now, so make the protections whatever you like. I just want to get the data structure down. OK, so as promised, every node has a reference for an item and a reference for its parent. To handle the children and, the link and linking them together, we're going to have every node store its leftmost child. We'll call that first child. But then it's the children's job, well, it's the first child's job to keep track of the other children. And so every sibtree node is going to have a field called next sibling to keep track of the next sibling in line. And so that's what our nodes will look like. And of 
course, I wanted a class to put this all into. And the main thing that the tree data structure itself needs to keep track of is the root, though it's also nice to remember the size so that you don't have to recalculate it every time you want to know it. So I'm going to draw a diagram of what this data structure looks like. But before I do that, are there any questions on this so far? Yeah? Uh, no, size is the number of nodes in the tree. Sometimes you might want to keep track of the height as well, but for today we won't bother. Yes? Okay. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Well, so what you're saying is you would have, instead of having a first child pointer, you just have a pointer to the sentinel of a linked list. And then the linked list would have list D-list nodes. And those D-list nodes would point at children? Um, OK, well, what you've just described is basically the Goodrich and Thomasia solution, which is fine. It's a, an alternative way to do things. The, the version that I'm showing you here, the, the SibTree node alternative, what that's going to do is use less memory, basically. So if you're really worried about memory, if you have a really huge trees to store and it actually matters how much memory it takes up, this might, this might be better for that. And same depth, that's right. Um, next sibling will, next sibling points to a node that's the same depth as this sib tree node. I'll draw a picture in a minute and it'll be really clear. Uh, did someone have a question in the middle? Okay. Yes? So there are some algorithms where you need to walk up through the tree. And you know, we'll talk about lots of tree algorithms this semester. So I can't give you a ready answer now, but it has. Yeah. First child is one of the children of this node. So I will draw the picture, and hopefully a lot of this stuff will become clear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my directory tree up here, and I'm going to draw it with a sib tree data structure. So at the top, we've got one sib tree object. Which says that there are 14 nodes in that tree. And here's the root. All right, so the way I'm going to draw these nodes, since I don't want to draw the little field names in every single node, is I'm going to use this key. Each node will be divided into four pieces with the parent pointer up top, the item in the middle, the first child in the lower left, and the next sibling in the lower right. And so I've got the root node here. And the root node has no parent, because the root node never has a parent. But it's the only node that has no parent. And then for the next level, I will have the 
homework directory and index.html. And the lab directory. And the lecture directory. And the root node is just going to point down to its first child, which is the homework directory. And then the way that you find all the other children is you follow the next sibling pointers across through the whole set of siblings, like that. The root node itself never has a sibling. And the parent pointers of all four of these nodes all point back to the root node. And finally, the lecture directory is the last sibling. There are no more children of the root node after that. So its next sibling pointer will be a null pointer, a null reference. So in essence, what the next sibling pointer does is it creates a singly linked list. It does it without using separate S-list nodes, which is why it saves memory, because you don't need separate S-list nodes on top of your sibtree nodes. Again, the disadvantage is now you're not leveraging all the work you used in writing singly linked list code. You have to write that code all over again. And given that, we can go on to the next level and have a homework one directory and a homework two directory. And a lab one directory and a lab two directory. And there's a bunch of files, which I, I won't do all of them. And so each of these are children of different parts of the tree. All right, pay more attention. Index.html has no children. This actually goes this way. So there you go. That is the sibtree node. Well, that's almost a complete sibtree. You can fill in the rest, I'm sure. Uh, questions about that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Say that again. So, are the parent and the child doubly linked? Not exactly, no. I mean, a parent only points to its first child and not directly to the other ones. So, I mean, you could say that they're circularly linked in that you, you, know, you can walk through the children and then back up to the parents and then back down through the children again, but not doubly linked. So the next topic about trees is called tree traversals. And a traversal is a manner of visiting every node in a tree once.
Now what you do when you visit a node is up to you. There's lots of different things you can do with tree traversals, like you can walk through a tree and just print out every node in the tree. And so then, in that case, visiting a node would just mean printing out its identity. Or you could walk through a tree and sum up all of the numbers that are stored in the tree, in which case visiting a node would mean summing up all of its descendants. And how exactly you want to do this depends on the application, what you're using it for. So I'll talk about a few examples, but let's look at what different types of traversals you have to choose from. Probably the most frequent type of traversal is called a pre-order traversal. So the idea of pre-order is that you're going to visit each node and right after you visit a node, you recursively visit its children. And the order you visit its children in is always left to right. And you always start by visiting the root. So I'm going to show you code for doing a pre-order traversal, and then I'll show you how it, what order it actually visits the nodes of a, of a tree in. But inside, it is definitely more convenient to define it in the sibtree node class than the sibtree class, because it's going to operate recursively on the nodes. So here's the pre-order method. And the first thing it's going to do is visit this node. Whatever visiting this node means, printing the node, summing the node, doing some computation on the node, whatever. Then it's going to visit the first child. If it has a first child, we need to check for that. And it does that recursively. Then it has to actually visit, make sure its siblings get taken care of as well after its children. If it has any more siblings. Just close off the braces. <clears throat> so there's the method. The method visits the nodes in this order. Well, I'm going to draw numbers which tell you what order the nodes get visited in. So the Number one visitation happens at the root of the tree. Then we visit the left child of the root second. We don't go on to the next child right away. Instead, 
too, gets all of its children visited before anyone else gets visited. So we do two's first child. In this case, three doesn't have a child, so we go on <clears throat> from three to three's next sibling, four, and then four's next sibling, five. And since five doesn't have a child either, now we backtrack up to two. And two says, okay, I'm done with all of my children. We can go on to my next sibling now. And so this node gets visited next. And then six has a child. And that child goes on to the next child. And so for that small example, that's the order in which the nodes get visited. Any questions about that? So each node is visited only once, and what that means is that this pre-order method is visited only once for each node. Now, the code in pre-order runs in constant time if you don't count the recursive calls. And since we know there's a total of a linear number of recursive calls, and each one of them just by itself accounts for big O of one time, uh, doing an entire pre-order traversal of a tree takes linear time. Where n is the number of nodes in the tree. Now, one of the things that a pre order traversal is nice for is it's just a natural way to print out the structure of a directory. Like, for instance, if I want a recursive printout of everything in the web directory over there, then you can print it out just in pre order and maybe add indentation according to the depth of each node. And then you get an output that looks something like this. If you do ls-r in Unix, you get something like this. So that's one example of what pre-order is good for. Any questions? A second kind of traversal is called a post-order traversal.
So in a post-order traversal, you visit the children of a node before you visit the node itself instead of, so the node puts the, its children before itself. And here's code to do that. So first you check if you have any children. And if you do, you do a post-order traversal of your children before you visit yourself. And then you visit yourself. And then you do your siblings last. And so a post-order traversal of the same tree we did before will look like this. So we start at the root, but the root's going to get visited last. We go down to the first child of the root, and it defers to its child, children. So the lower left node gets visited first, and then it goes on to its sibling, and it goes on to its sibling. Only after all of the grandkids at of that, well, only after the kids of this node have been visited does this node itself get visited. And then the recursion backtracks to the root, but the root, well, it doesn't backtrack to the root. Four defers now to its next sibling, and that sibling defers to its children. So this one gets visited fifth, this one gets visited sixth, and only then does their parent get visited? And then the root of the tree gets visited last. So that's a post-order traversal. Any questions about that? No questions? Why do they call it post order? Um, the post just means that each node is visited after its children. So the node is putting itself last. Post. So a post order traversal is what is it good for? Well, it's a natural way to sum the total disk space in those directories. Why is that? Well, suppose that visiting a node means you add up all of the disk space occupied by that node and its subdirectories. Well, can you visit this node first? Well, no, you can't because you can't sum up what's in all of its subdirectories until you've gone through the subdirectories and actually looked at the files there. So basically, you need to start by figuring out how much memory or how much disk space does this file take? How much disk space does this file take? And only after you've visited those two can you go back and say, how much memory does the entire homework directory take? And only when you've gone through all of these directories here can you finally go back 
in the very end, and the last thing you do is figure out how much disk space the entire schmear takes. So that's an example of what a post-order traversal is good for, is summing up everything in a tree. A third type of traversal is defined only on binary trees. They allow for something called an in-order traversal. <clears throat> and here the idea is that you visit the left child, if there is one. Then you visit the node itself. Then you visit the node's right child. Now, the pre-order, in-order, and post-order traversals of an expression tree give you formulae that are called prefix, infix, and postfix expressions. So for instance, let's look at this expression tree. I'm adding two numbers. One of the numbers I get by multiplying 3 and 7. The other number I get by taking 4 to the second power. So that's an expression tree. And if I do an in order traversal of that, then I get an infix expression, which goes like this. I start at the plus, I visit its left child, I visit its left child, and I get a 3. I come back, I visit the multiplier. I go down, I visit the right child. I backtrack to the root, and I visit the root. I go down to the right child, and then go to its left child and visit the 4, then I visit the exponent sign, and then I visit the 2. And so in order gives you a natural way, that us humans are accustomed to, of writing out an expression. Whereas if you do it in pre-order, you get something that computers find easier to read, and we humans find harder to read. Or you could do it in post-order. Again, easier for computers to read, harder for us humans. Any questions about these traversals of that tree? Yeah. Um, the reason it's easier for a computer to read is when a computer looks at this, it doesn't know whether you should multiply first and then add and then do the exponent. Or maybe, maybe that's not right. Maybe you should do the exponent first and then add and then do the multiplier last. Or how do you tell? Well, with pre-order and post-order, there's no ambiguity. There's only one way to parse this pre-order expression and determine the order in which the operations should occur. And same for the post-order expression. But the in-order expression is uh, vague. And we humans have precedence rules that decide which operations are more important and should be done first. And so I'll talk about expression parsing late in the semester for how we parse something like this into an expression tree. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry. Um, that is also big O of n for the same reason. This, this method gets called just once on each node in the tree, and for each call it runs in constant time, not counting recursive calls. So now let's go on to traversal number four. A level order traversal is a little more complicated than the other ones. You start by visiting the root. Uh, then you visit all the depth one nodes in order from left to right.
And then you visit all the depth two nodes. And then you visit all the depth three nodes and so on until you get to the bottom of the tree. And so if you do a level order traversal of our tree up there, then you get the first row, the second row, and the third row, which doesn't mean very much. So in general, there's no reason to do a level order traversal of an expression tree, but there are other trees we'll see this semester where you do want to do a level order traversal. And so the question is, how do you implement this? Unlike the other ones, this is not naturally recursive. It is not easy to implement this as a recursive procedure. So we're going to do something else. Here's our algorithm. We're going to use a queue, which is a list where you can add things to the end of the list and take things off of the beginning of the list. And this queue initially contains only the root. And then you repeat the following steps over and over again. First of all, DQ a node from the front of the list. Second of all, visit the node you just dequeued. And third, NQ its children from left to right. And when you enqueue those, those go at the end of the list. And you repeat that until the queue is empty. So let's do that using this tree. Here's my queue. So I'm going to start with a queue that just has the root on it. I'm going to dequeue the root. I'm going to put its children onto the end of the queue. Now I repeat the loop. I'm going to dequeue the multiplier. I'm going to visit it. And then I'm going to put its children at the end of the queue. Now I'm going to dequeue the exponentiation sign, visit it, and put its children at the end of the queue. Then I dequeue the 3, visit it. It doesn't have any children, so there's nothing to add to the queue. And I do the same with the 7, 4, and 2. And that's how I do a level order traversal of that tree. Any questions about that? All right, then. See you next time.